find one very simple thing. And if there's time, and I, don't, I know I'm now standing between you and your tea break, so that's not a good place to be. So um, what I'd like to try and do is show you how it actually connects to the kind of stuff that you guys might be interested in. I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to do it, but I'll touch on it at the end, and if anyone's interested, I can say a little bit about it. So um, this is really ongoing work. Um, I guess we proved the first theorems in 2010, it's been developed since then. Um, maybe as I go through it, there'll be things that may seem a bit familiar, but you might wonder if there's any connection with the stuff that interests you. But right at the end, I'll try and point out the things which I think are directly related to the stuff that you might be interested in. For example, things such as effect patterns. Um, I mentioned all of these people here so that the blame can be fairly shared. Uh, Phil Scott is actually here, and he's sitting over there. So if you want to blame anyone, I'd recommend blaming Phil. <laughs> so what is this stuff about? I'm going to begin by just giving you a kind of um, background feel for the subject, and then I'm going to do something that Christian will find a bit strange. I'm going to state a theorem. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try and give you enough idea to understand what this theorem says, and then we're going to have a corollary to that theorem. Uh, and then I'm going to try and make connections with other parts of mathematics. So what's the background to this? Uh, as you know, or may have heard, uh, there are people interested in something called non-commutative geometry. And non-commutative geometry is basically the theory of C-strike algebras, particularly non-commutative C-strike algebras, where you pretend that the C-strike algebra is a proxy for a topological space, a non-commutative topological space. Justification for that is that the commutative C surroundings are in duality with locally compact household spaces. So you therefore think of an arbitrary C algebra as being a proxy for something that should be a non commutative topological space. Sorry, Mark, you've lost me already. It doesn't matter, this is background. I want to give you some moon music, and I know where you live. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to explain. <laughs> it doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a non commutative Oh, I see. Space. Yes. Yeah, we've got it. It takes some of a bit longer to understand things. Um, so the idea is you've got commutative spaces over here, commutative C surroundings over here. Okay. Non commutative C surroundings over here. So you think, you go, thinks, what could be a non commutative topological space? And your answer is, I have the foggiest idea, but it doesn't matter because I can work with the non-commutative c algebra. It's a proxy. And, uh, Sorry, just... Yeah, by all means. Are these c algebra algebras also being told? Don't care. In okay. fact, um, in fact, because I said locally compact, locally no, compact, right. yes. it's not necessarily unitary. If it's, if it's compact, it's unitary. So whether you work with a monoid or a semigroup is important, as I will explain later. Monoid means compact, semigroup means locally compact. So, um, and there's a lot of work being done on this, and for example, people are trying to develop things like differential geometry in a non-commutative framework. So this really goes back to Alan Collin and his whole program of non-commutative geometry. But, you see, I think this is a bit like the way we teach topological spaces to our students. We tell them about general topological spaces, and then actually we work with things like simplicial complexes or locally complex spaces. We tell them about general groups, and then we tell them about finite groups or lead groups. So in reality, in reality, many of the C star algebras that are studied, non-commutative actually do come from something that you could think of as being a non-commutative topological space, namely a topological groupoid. And that's the theme I'm going to pursue in this talk, and Jamie, I will tell you what a topological groupoid is later. You just have to be patient. Now, all this stuff goes back to a monograph by Jean Renaud in 1980. And I, came, I was aware of this stuff when I was a grad student because I was working in inverse semigroups. And the mysterious thing about this book which is about topological groupoids, thinking of them as big non-commutative spaces. 
and their corresponding C parameters, is that all the way through this program, there are things called inverse subgroups, which are certain kinds of generalizations of groups. And it was mysterious to me what these algebraic objects were doing in a book that was primarily about topological type things such as topological group voids and maybe analytic or continuous type things such as Caesar algebras. And it stopped me one In the 1990s, uh, by a sequence of concatenation of bizarre circumstances, I came across the work of Johannes Kellenbuch. And Johannes was working on a periodic tiles. He was a federal physicist, and because of the work of Dan Shepman in the 80s, where they had discovered quasar crystals in nature, it had revitalized the area of aperonic tiles, such as Penrose tiles. And the physicists were starting to ask questions about the physical properties of such things as models of quasar crystals. And so Calabar wrote this paper, which was all about a K0 group associated with an aperonic type. And the K0 group gave physically uh, important information about the physical properties of the aperiodic type. Now, the K0 group, which if I have time, I'll tell you what is at the end, it's related to effect algebras. The K0 group came from the topological group point that he constructed from the aperiodic type. Okay? But that wasn't the only object he constructed from the time. What he actually directly constructed was a combinatorial from which he then derived the topological group point, from which he then constructed the C-star algebra. And he felt that this combinatorial object actually contained a lot of the information that he was actually interested in, potentially information about the K0 group that came right at the end of the process. And this combinatorial object was an inverse symbol. Now, the idea is very simple. In a periodic crystal, you have global translation symmetries. In an aperiodic crystal, you don't. That's the definition. So what he did was find a way of modeling partial translational symmetries. And the inverse semigroup encoded information about the partial translational symmetries of the aperiodic type. And that was the combinatorial object that was used ultimately to get the K0 group that he actually wanted to compute. And of course, as someone who worked in inverse semigroup theory, this interested me a lot. And so here we had two examples directly motivated by Renard. So this really put the question to me. What is the relationship between topological group points, which we should think of as being proxies, actually, sorry, for being actually non-commutative topological spaces, and these algebraic objects, which interested me, which are the inverse semigroup? This talk is going to explain exactly what that connection is and the consequences of that connection. It spells out precisely the relationship between these algebraic objects on the one hand and these topological group points on the other. Okay? So that's the, the plan of the talk, and that's the background to all of these, all the work that we've been doing. Directly motivated, interesting enough, by certain elements in solid state physics. So, what I'm going to have to do is tell you about inverse semigroups. I'm going to have to tell you about topological group points and why you should think of them as being non commutative spaces. And then I'll show you how those two structures are linked together. And then we'll derive a corollary, and then I'll make some connections with things like effect algebras if I don't have time. Okay. Any questions so far? Jamie's sort of prowling around the room in a long fashion. Okay, I might certainly move on. So let me, uh, by the way, I think it's very nice for Chris to invite all of us here, uh, given that we have all sorts of diverse backgrounds. It's a bit of a shock to me to see my colleagues from Harry Potter over there who I never talk to ordinarily because they're physical physicists and computer scientists. And here we are in the same room together, and they haven't really listened to me whisper on. Okay, so let me begin with inverse semigroups. Now, inverse semigroups are, uh, in fact, uh, an encoding of an idea that goes back to the work of Sophistry in the 19th century, as I'll explain. They are, if you like, the modern incarnation of pseudo groups of transformations. And I'll explain exactly what I mean by that a bit later. The way I come at this is the following that symmetry is really more than just groups. 
as soon as you start looking at fractal type pictures and self similarity, you realize that groups aren't going to be enough to capture all the different notions of symmetry that exist in the world. And my argument is that inverse semi groups are very good at capturing a more general kind of symmetry, namely partial symmetries. And I'll say what partial symmetries are the matter. But the thing you have to sort of fix in your mind is that as groups are to classical symmetry, so inverse semi groups are to partial symmetry. So you should see them as being generalizations of groups. And their definition is a direct generalization of the definition of a group. OK. So that's my definition. So say you can the inverse. If for every element there's a unique element a to the minus 1, unique, that's important, such that those two equations are. to think that a minus 1 times a is the identity element, that would only be true in a group. In general, a, a minus 1, and a minus 1, a will be minor totals. So these will be semi-groups or monoids with lots of minor totals. Minor potent being elements equal to itself when squared. If it has one item potent, it will be a group. The idempotent structure will be a kind of geometry sitting inside the inverse semi group. Okay, that's the idea. Now, let me give you a concrete model to think of. So you take any binary set X, just think of it as a set, and take all the bijections between subsets of that set. So we call those partial bijections. Now, of course, you've got all the bijections of the set to itself, You've got all the bijections on the individual sets, but you've also got all the bijections between the different sets sitting inside if they have the same size. And you've got a zero at the bottom that comes from the empty set. <laughs> you can multiply these together, they're binary relations after all. You might get zero as an answer, or you might not. So what you'll certainly have is a semi-group structure. In other words, you'll have an associative binary operation. And it's easy to check that this is in fact an inverse semigroup. If you have a partial bijection that goes that way, the a minus 1 is the partial bijection that goes back again. If you start here, go out and come back, what you will get is the identity function defined on the domain. If you go the other way, you get the identity function defined on the range. It will turn out that the idempotency here are precisely the identity functions defined on the subsets. Zero down the bottom, one at the top, and of course they'll form a Boolean algebra. And when you multiply two partial identities together, all you're going to do is take the intersection of their domains of definition and take the identity function defined on that. So the idempotents will commute with each other. Okay. And in fact, there's a nice theorem, the Vulcan Preston theorem is the KD theorem for these things, that says that every inverse semi group could be embedded in one of these groups. And that tells us something else. The idempotents in an inverse semigroup always commute with each other. Now, I always tell this story because it's kind of nice. It was proved in two different places at the same time. This theory started in the 1950s during the Cold War, which meant that results were proved in Eastern Europe independently of them being proved in the West, almost sometimes at the same time. That particular result about commuting iron components was proved by Gustav in uh, Russia, and it was proved by my colleague Douglas Mann, who was in Glasgow, and Roger Penrose, because they were friends of Baylor College, had a chat over dinner. Roger Penrose was writing his thesis on generalized inverses, which looked a bit like this, and they realized there was a connection between their research work. So these are semi groups with lots of iron components, and the iron components always commute inside, but they don't have to be central. Okay, now, this is the key. If you think about partial bijections or partial functions in general, partial functions come with an ordering. If you have a partial function and you take a subset of the domain, you can restrict the partial function, you get another partial function. So partial functions automatically come with an ordering. Now what's remarkable is that that ordering in the symmetric inverse model can be described purely algebraically. You don't have to impose the order from outside. 
So inside every inverse semigroup, we can define A is equal to B if A is equal to B, A minus 1, A. And if you picture what's going on in terms of the symmetric inverse monoid, this is saying that A minus 1, A is the domain of definition of the element A. B times A minus 1, A is restricting B to the domain of A. And then you're saying it's equal to A. And this is a partial order, and with respect to that ordering, Every inverse semigroup is naturally a partially ordered set and a partially ordered semigroup. So it behaves itself. So if A is less than B, then A minus 1 is less than B minus 1. Okay. It doesn't fit in over, by the way, which is what group theory is always said. Because if you restrict and go backwards, you don't interchange. You just go backwards. So in a symmetric inverse monoid, the natural partial ordering is, of course, just the usual ordering of partial bijections. So we've got a partial ordered structure. If you now look at the idempotents, when you restrict that ordering to the idempotents, you get a neat semilattice. So that means that every two elements have a greatest well band. And that, of course, is just the product of the two idempotents. So there's algebraic structure, and there's order theoretic structure going on at the same time. Yeah. Uh, just a, a very basic sanity check here. If A is less than or equal to B, and B is less than or equal to A, is A equal to B? Yes. It's a, it's a proper partial order. Okay, not a pre -order. Okay, now, this is the one bit where you have to pay attention to understand what's going to happen next. So you've got two elements inside your inverse semigroup, and you say, okay, maybe we can form their join. Now think about partial bijections. If you take two partial bijections on the set, and you take their union, you will not necessarily get a partial bijection. Because anything in the intersection of the domains may get mapped to two different things. Or you may have two different things mapped into something in the intersection of their images. So you can't just take unions willy-nilly, even inside the symmetric inverse model. You have to have a precondition. So the precondition, it's very easy to check, and this works for symmetric inverse monoids. If I give you two partial bijections, A and B, in a symmetric inverse monoid, under what circumstances will the join exist? Algebraically, it's equivalent to saying that A minus 1, B, and A, B minus 1 are both either poles. If that holds, they match up on their intersection and on their co-intersection, you can loop them together. If it doesn't hold, something will go wrong. The result will not be a partial bijection. So inside every inverse semigroup, we can't talk about arbitrary joins. We have to talk about joins where the two elements meet this compatibility condition first. So I'll say that an inverse semigroup has compatible joins if you take any two elements. If they're compatible in this sense, then they do have a join. Now, this begins to sound like lattice theory, but it's lattice theory with this compatibility relation in the background, and that starts to interfere with your computations. It makes it a bit more complicated. So, and I'm going to give some sort of concrete examples in a minute, but let me give you some definitions, and I'm going to go back to pseudogroups and just say where this comes from before I move on to group points. So, if you've got an inverse semigroup, you can ask the question, does it have all compatible finite joints? Does it have all compatible infinite joins? So if it has all compatible finite joins, and if the multiplication distributes over the joins that exist, we call it distributive. But remember that you don't have a background lattice going on. It's a sort of partial lattice. So we talk about distributive uh, inverse semigroups. If multiplication distributes over the joins, which the ones that should exist do exist. So the symmetric inverse monoids are distributive in that sense. If on the other hand you have arbitrary joins, we're going to use the term pseudogroup. I'm going to explain where that term comes from in a minute. And if you've got a distributive inverse semigroup and the idempotents form a Boolean algebra under the induced ordering, we're going to call it a Boolean inverse semigroup. Now let's think about what we've done. You've got complete infinitely distributed matrices known as frames, which are commutative. We've generalized those to pseudogroups. We now have lots of non-idempotent elements. 
good example of a completely different distributed lattice is the lattice of open subsets of a topological space. That's where the idea comes from. If you have a distributed lattice, it's generalized to a distributed inverse subunit. If you have a Boolean algebra, it's generalized to a Boolean inverse subunit. Here is commutative, here is non commutative. Here everything is idempotent, here most things are not idempotent. So the question is can we actually generalize the classical commutative theory of lattices to this non commutative setting and prove interesting theory? A generalized Boolean algebra, this is a numerical non numerical business. In classical algebra, a Boolean algebra always has a top element. But there's also a thing called a generalized Boolean algebra where you don't have a top element. Now, in fact, this is important. I'm going to call Boolean algebras with a top element unitor. And a Boolean algebra with amplification is just a Boolean algebra without a top element. The first gives you compact spaces, the second gives you locally compact spaces. So the distinction is actually an important one, even though it sounds very minor. And you can't take a, a Boolean inverse sum and simply stick an identity on and think it's going to become a Boolean inverse model. It won't be, because you'll be missing all the components. What are you doing with mutation if there's no top element? You look at, you, uh, you do it locally. So you pick an item potent, and beneath every item potent you have a Boolean algebra. So the negations are calculated locally. Okay. And that's enough to have what's called a general algebra. Element is equal to its square. Okay? Now I'm going to give you a concrete example of which this whole theory comes. And it's in French because Phil's French speaker. So, um, <laughs> half of the time. So, where does this all come from? So, in the 19th century, uh, Sophus Lee developed a theory of what called finite continuous groups, and that led to the theory of new groups. He also introduced things called infinite continuous groups, they weren't groups. In the 19th century, the distinction that we make between functions and partial functions was not clearly made. Someone like Sophus Lee would move backwards and forwards between globally defined functions and partially defined functions, and the reader would just be expected to catch up. Now, if you take the notion of group, and you go, what happens if, instead of thinking of bijections, I think of partial bijections, you get an inverse semi -group. So inverse semi were implicit in 19th century mathematics. In the early decades of the 20th century, it was realized that inverse semigroups are partial homeomorphisms. So, homey so homeomorphisms between the open subsets of topological space could serve as the foundation for differential geometry. Everyone in this room who's taken a course in differential geometry has seen at least one pseudo group in their lives. You take Rn and you take the smooth maps between the open subsets of Rn. That's a, a complete inverse subgroup. It's a pseudogroup of partial smooth maps on Euclidean space. And that's used to construct differential manifolds using atlases. If you're interested in other kinds of things in differential geometry, such as bundles of various kinds of foliations, they are all defined using different notions of pseudogroup. So this is Klein's Elena program from the 19th century, which was based on groups generalized in the 20th century to pseudogroups of transformations. And that's not an empty comment. So the guy whose work I followed most was Charles Eggersman, who was an Alsatian mathematician in the 50s and 60s. He was the first person I know of to apply category theory to differential geometry. He axiomatized the foundations of differential geometry in categorical language using an abstract definition of pseudogroup. And the abstract definition of pseudogroup is exactly what I told you, an inverse semigroup that has all compatible joins and where multiplication distributes over compatible joins. And in a sequence of papers that almost no one reads anymore, he showed how all the structures in differential geometry could be described using this process and then start investigating particular properties. So here's the guy, along with his student, uh, Reed, who introduced foliation theory. If you work in differential geometry over the Erickson connections, it's the same guy. So this work came directly out of the 20th century generalization of the 19th century group theoretic approach to geometry. Okay. And if you want to know more about pseudogroups, you can 
a recent textbook by Bill Thurston, very famous geometer, page 110, it gives the definition of pseudo group and then shows how that's used to define structures in differential geometry. This is a current notion. Almost no one's aware that this thing was formalized in the 1950s. And there's an algebraic theory of pseudo groups. I'm going to show you how it works. I'll try and do no more than 10 minutes so you guys can have your tea break. Right. Groupoids, I'm sure this is going to be less problematical. So, a groupoid is, for me, it's a small category in which every arrow is invertible. Uh, I think of categories as one sorted structures, so everything inside the category is an arrow. So, the objects can be replaced by the identity functions of human on the objects. I think of a groupoid as a generalized group, or a group with many identities. That's very common in the algebraic way of thinking about it. Um, I need one notion. This is going to be key. So there's my, there's my notation for a groupoid, and here is the space of identities. I'm interested in certain kinds of subsets of a group, a groupoid, which are called local bisections. And these are defined as follows. I'll say what they mean in a second. So a minus one a should consist entirely of identities. A, A minus 1 should consist entirely of identities. What does it mean? It means if you take two elements in A, they have the same domain, they must be equal. If they have the same range, they must be equal. It's called a local bisection. Okay, local, because I'm not saying that A minus 1 A equals the set of all identities. Now here's the kind of starting point of the connection between groupoids and inverse semigroups. If you take the set of all local bisections, of a group point, the street group point. It always forms an inverse set. Multiplication of two subsets is what we think it, think it is. You multiply all the pairs that can be multiplied together to get the output. The inverse operation is simply take the inverse of everything inside your subset. Amazingly, it works. Okay, this is just an ordinary discrete group point. There's no topology on here yet, but it's telling us that group points are related to inverse set. Now, go the other way, we're going to need some extra structure. And this is where I'm going to explain why you should think of topological groupoids as being non commutative spaces. So, a topological groupoid is what you think it is. It's a groupoid with a topology, so that multiplication and inversion are continuous maps. Now, if that groupoid just restricts to its space of identities, all you've got is a topological space. So the ordinary topological spaces are just the identity spaces of your topological group point. The group point structure is introducing some twisting. It is, I think, we're introducing your non commutative structure. And this is a very common conceit throughout the subject that a topological group point should be thought of as an actual non commutative space. Okay. Now, we're going to look at a very special class of group points, and these are the ones that are most common in applications. So you've got the domain range maps. We're going to require that these are local homomorphisms, local homeomorphisms. So what that means is that for every point in your group point, it's being sent down to the identity space, say, by like the domain map. And for every open set around here, you can find an open set around the image so that you've actually got a homeomorphism between the two. It's totally meaningless. When I first saw that definition, I just thought, so what? So why would a tau group point be the ones that we should be interested in? Now, this is where my colleague Pedro Vicente in 2007, uh, as I was saying to some of you, uh, Pedro started off working at CERN. Uh, he was then converted, uh, saw the light, was converted, and works now in Topos theory in Lisbon. And uh, he noted the following. The, so I mentioned a topological group point here. And I tell you that the open subsets under multiplication form the monoid, then that group point must be A tau. And vice versa. So the A tau topological group points are those where the set of open sets actually forms a monoid under composition. So multiplication of subsets is what I expect. Exactly what you expect. Point wise, yeah. Point wise. So that's kind of amazing, because it's saying that you've got something over here which is supposed to be a non-commutative topological space, 
And over here, the open subsets actually form an algebraic structure. And so you begin to wonder whether you can pair the two off. And that's exactly what you can do if you look correct. And okay, that's the non commutative part. That's the non commutative part because the monoid you get is actually non commutative. And of course, if you just go down to a topological space, it will be commutative because multiplication of open subsets of topological space is just their intersection. So it's genuinely algebraic and non commutative. Can you say so, that again, please? I'm going to take the theorem and then I'll give you special cases and come back to your question. I'll come back to your point in a second. Okay. Let me say the general result first. So, give me any A tail group. Take all the open local bisections. Then that forms a pseudo group. So it's a, if you will, a complete inverse semigroup. If your A tail groupoid reduces to the identity space, then the pseudo group will simply be the lattice of open subsets of your space, and the multiplication is simply the intersection of open subsets, and so it's commutative. And in that case, everything is on potent. So topological spaces are being mapped to their lattice of open subsets, and eight hour topological groupoids are being mapped to their pseudogroups, which are non-commutative. So pseudogroups generalize the lattice of open subsets of a topological space. That's very common. The question is how on earth do you go the other So I give you a pseudogroup. So if you will, it's, it's a bit like a lattice ordered in the sum. And what you've got to do is to construct an A tail topological group point from it. So where do you start? Well, you remember what Marshall Stone did in 1936. What Marshall Stone proved was that if you start with a sufficiently nice space and you look at, if you start with a sufficiently nice algebra, and you look at the filters or big filters inside that algebra, it's ordered, you can get points of a topological space. So we basically copy what Stone did in a slightly more general setting. So we look at what I call completely prime filters. So what is a completely prime filter? I'll give you a concrete example. Take any topological space and take a point. Take all the open sets that contain that point. That will be an example of a completely prime filter. So you write down the properties that that partial order set has, and you transplant it to the work pseudogroups. So the points of the groupoid, each point will be one of these completely prime filters. A set of elements closed upwards and under finite intersections, and closed under some other properties. Know what they are. Then you define a topology on that guy. And then you have to find a way of multiplying these guys together. That's the interesting bit. That's the hard thing. So we define a function going the other way. Here we've got an algebraic object. Over here, we've got an A tail topological groupoid. And if you start an A tail topological groupoid, you get back to you. This is an injunction. If you start in the world of pseudo groups and go out and come back, you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily get back to where you started, but there's something a little bit bigger in general, but a bit bigger in a very precise way. Likewise, if you start with an A-tail groupoid, go around and come back, you get something a little bit bigger, but a bit bigger in a very precise way. So we've got a relationship between order, theoretic, algebraic structures on the one hand, and non-commutative spaces on the other. Yeah? Are the two categories um related in any way if you start from here and go and come back. That's exactly what the word adjunction tells you. So that encodes a lot of information about how those things are related. Okay? I'm sketching over that bit because you, it takes time just to write in the details. But there are precise relationships. It's a precise relationship between these two categories. So, um, again, just to check, when you said a little bit bigger, is this some kind of compactification? No, it's, it's actually just a factorization result. So I don't want to go into detail. Right. Okay. And the other question. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of Pontals. Is it reasonable to suspect? Yes, it is. 
There's another approach to all of this which uses context. Thank you. Uh, which I'm not going to talk about. Okay, but it's in there. So there's quantile theory in here, there's inverse semi-group theory, and there's groupoid theory, and there's Caesar algebra theory. And they're all in there, and they're all interrelated. Okay? Right, now what I want to do is just get to the special case, the corollary of this result, and then I'll show you how this stuff is used, just to finish off. So we're going to go back to the world of Boolean stuff. So what I'm really interested in is defining non-commutative Boolean algebra. Non-commutative meaning, if you think of the classical case of an AND operation, that AND operation is commutative. What could it possibly mean for that to be non-commutative? What property should it have? So I've already mentioned this a little bit. So a locally compact Boolean space is a locally compact Hausdorff space with the basis of cloaking subsets. So there are special kinds of locally compact Hausdorff spaces with a very nice basis. A Boolean groupoid is simply an atautological groupoid, the ones I talked about, whose identity space is a locally compact Boolean space. Okay. If I've got a Boolean groupoid, I don't just want to look at the open local bisections now, I want to look at the compact open local bisections. And this time, if I've got a Boolean inverse set group, I don't want to look at the completely prime filters, but at the ultra filters. These are the maximal filters. Now, if you go back to classical Stone's theory, you've got, let's say, unical Boolean algebras over here, and a compact Boolean spaces over here, and there's a duality between the two cables. This is going to generalize classical Stone duality. So let me show you how it works. So if you start with a Boolean, if you start with a um, Boolean ATL group point, and take the compact open subsets, you get a Boolean inverse set. If you start with a, a Boolean, if you start with a Boolean inverse semigroup and take the ultra filters on it, then you get a Boolean group point. But this time you don't get a junction between two categories, you get a dual equivalence. So if you start with a Boolean group as a Boolean inverse semigroup, you go across to the Boolean group point and you come back, you end up where you started precisely. If you start with a Boolean ATL groupoid, go across and come back, you get back to an isomorphic copy of where you started. So you've actually got, and I say dual equivalence, and I've left the maps in the background, it could take too long to explain them. The maps get turned around. Algebra and geometry are always expected to be a dual equivalence rather than a dual equivalence. So, we've now got a class of non commutative Boolean numbers, and we've got a class of non commutative spaces that come from the generalization of classical stone duality. Here's a baby example. If you take a finite Boolean algebra, you know that that is isomorphic to the power set of a finite set. Okay? Now, the power set of a finite set is just all the subsets of your finite set. A finite set is ultimately compact in the discrete topology. And because it's just a space of points, every subset is a local bisection, it's automatically open. So the compact open local bisections of a finite degree discrete set is precisely this Boolean algebra of subsets. So this is that this is a grown-up version of that theory. Now I'm going to finish off by just pointing out one or two things. This is related to a remarkable number of different parts of mathematics. And I think I'm just going to pick up two points because I, I heard some things in previous talks and I think it may be interesting for you guys to mention. So let me just say something about that part in the algebras. Now, I don't have the time, so all I'll say is there are things called effective algebras which are being studied. Oops, this thing moves. There are things called effective algebras which are currently being studied, and you were studying them from a categorical perspective. A special class of effect algebras are called NV algebras. And an NV algebra comes from multiple value logic. So they're special kinds of effect algebras. Now, here's the thing. Every NV algebra can be coordinatized by a suitable Boolean inverse semigroup. And what do I mean by that? 
If you give me an MV algebra, we can find a Boolean inverse semigroup of the type I've described. If you take the set of all principal ideals that Boolean inverse semigroup, it naturally acquires, if you have the right properties, the structure of an MV algebra. And every MV algebra arises in that way. It's certainly true, though, this is something that this is a result of fellow I proved in the countable case and was proved in the general case by Fred Vrabel just last year. It's almost certainly true that the effect algebras which have what's called the refinement property are also all coordinatizable by inverse summons, though we don't have a proof of that. Now, MV algebras were, uh, arose originally for multiple value logic, replacing binary logic by you know, arbitrary many true facts. And they arose first as the Lindenbaum algebras of a certain kind of logical system, called the type system. These Boolean inverse semigroups were developed with a kind of logical background but coming from topology. You have potentially two different ways of thinking about non commutative Boolean algebras, and one, in some sense, is derived from the other. Boolean inverse semigroups are more general. So here's the thing what kind of logics are associated with more general kinds of Boolean inverse semigroups? And the second point, and this is where I would finish. See strangers. Boolean inverse semigroups have properties remarkably similar to C star algebras of real rank zero. Now, what do I mean by that? You might have heard of Kuntz C star algebras. You might have heard of Kuntz Krieger C star algebras. And you might have heard of AF or approximately finite C star algebras. In every single case, there is a Boolean inverse monoid analog. The group wide associated with each of those guys is exactly the group wide associated with the corresponding group points of those C star algorithms. These are, in some sense, and I don't want to use the word, but I don't, I don't know what other word to use, discrete versions of these C star algorithms. Now, what about finite dimensional C star algorithms? Okay, I'll finish with this. Because this turned out to be clue as to what was going on with these guys. So, as you all were in kindergarten, if you went to the right kind of kindergarten. <laughs> so this is the set of n by n matrices over the complex numbers regarded as a C surround. So this is an example of a finite dimensional C surround. And if you want to know what the finite dimensional C surround look like, they look like that. Those are the basic building blocks. So for example, direct limits of these guys give you approximately now, that is a Caesar algebra. Now I'm going to write down a Boolean inverse 1, which will be the discretized version of this guy. So what do I do? Well, I want the N1. I'm kind of committed to that. So what I do is I look at the symmetric inverse monoid on N1 elements. So if N1 were 3, it would be all the partial bijections of 3 elements. And you take the direct product. Now that is a finite Boolean inverse monoid. Not finite dimensional, but finite. It turns out that all finite Boolean inverse monoids which are what are called fundamental, are these guys. If you take direct limits of these things, you get the Boolean inverse monoid analogues of approximately finite C3 algebras. And the K0 groups of the corresponding AF algebras are exactly the same as the K0 groups of these guys. So the Boolean inverse monoids in the AF case contain exactly the same combinatorial information as AF C star algorithms. And AF C star algorithms are about as discrete as I can imagine C star algorithms being, since they're described by directed graphs called graphic diagrams. So that's the big picture. There's also connections with dynamic systems, A-plate timings, going back to the work of Calendon. So with every A-plate timing, there is a Boolean inverse monoid that could be used to construct a C star algorithm. Monoids have groups of units. The groups that arise are things like the Thomson-Hickman groups, which are interesting to be 
So this is a way of bringing together sort of topology and algebra and combinatorics into one framework. And the thing that Phil and I are particularly interested in is this connection with MV algebras and perhaps generalizations of MV algebras if you have more general kinds of them. So at this point, I think we all need a cup of tea. So thank you very much. Thank you. 